right, so here's, the, here's what we got coming together. In, uh, it's, it's, it's coming from a couple of different directions. One, it's back to Church Sunday, yeah. which is, yes. And um, we've been celebrating back to Church Sunday. It's a national event for well over 10 years now because it really matches up with the heart of our church. Um, we started out of a Christian bookstore, and a big part of our heart was and continues to be for people that you've been hooked by church before, hooked by Christians before, meeting them where they're at and showing uh, and trying to live a little bit more of a biblical understanding of what church is supposed to be versus maybe some of the options people have had in the past. So Back to Church Sunday really stands out to us. Now, it's not National Back to Church Sunday, even though that's what it says a sign, because the National Back to Church Sunday is the end of September. Uh, we don't do it at the end of September anymore. Uh, we have found over the last five years, especially since kind of the COVID end of things, and with the weather changing in Ohio the way that it has over time, that when you have Back to Church Sunday, which also reaches out to people who let the summer kind of overtake their schedule and get out of the habit of church, divide them back into, people are still not ready for that. It's, oh, I got one last weekend. We've got to go camping this weekend. I got one last weekend. We've got to let, let's go get on the boat, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, and so it's been pushed back a little bit, which is not necessarily a good thing. But since we try to celebrate it every week, it's okay for us to move it back a little bit too, meet people where they're at, and see what God's doing with it. Does that make sense? So we've got this whole animal of Back to Church Sunday and what that means. On the other side of things, if you've been around for a while, uh, we are coming out of Holy Spirit chaos. We were in a series on Acts um, for a long period of time about what our mission is as Christians and as a church and how that plays out, that we are to take and lead people to Jesus, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to disciple one another, which means help each other grow through this life and to grow to be more like Jesus and how Jesus impacts our life, to laugh with each other, cry with each other, uh, not just within our hometown or our local church but, uh, as well, but also within our country, within, uh, don't worry, I'm not getting political, uh, but it's within our country, our hometown, our people that are different than us, which for them was the Samaritans, and then the whole world. And we were looking at how the early church did that so we can learn from it as well. And then the Holy Spirit st said, oh, we're going to stop for a little while and we're doing this whole other thing that we did for, what, two months on the statements of Jesus uh, and what if he was serious about those statements. And we just left it hanging in Acts 11 not knowing if we're going to come back or not. Uh, but I do think we're going to step in. I don't know what it's going to look like from here on out, but I have a pretty good feel for today that we're going to be bringing back in Acts 11 on a church called Antioch, which is my favorite church in the scripture. So, Holy Spirit, how do you do the two together in a way that makes a difference? And I'm telling you, it's never been hard to figure out what he's doing when he has weird moments like this. He always lines things up perfectly. So that's kind of the heart behind what we're going to be studying today as we lean back into Acts, uh, and hopefully you'll kind of see how that plays out as we go. My first hope is to really introduce you to the Church of Antioch and why I think it's so awesome. Um, and also then really start to pick it apart about how we need to lean into that so that it's a church that's welcoming to people in a way that maybe they haven't had before. Does that sound good? You guys in for that? Yeah. And I've been watching the podcast for the last three weeks with the guest speakers, and thank you, Monica, and thank you, the Howells, and thank you, Bob, my mentor, um, for, for being here, but they really let you out of here early. So I have extra banked time. I'm just saying. So don't get mad at me if this, this, this is because we're digging in today. So let's go ahead and get our Bibles out. We'll go to Acts chapter 11. Put that up on the screen there for you. Acts chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be, we already covered the first part there, 1 through 18, when Peter was coming back and giving a report of what he was seeing within the Gentile community. Again, so far up to this point, We've seen the hometown aspect of things. We've seen people uh, that are in the country aspect of things. And, we've, and because of persecution, being pushed out more to Samaria, to the people that are different than us. But things are really started opening up to the whole world. And so Peter has come back, and he's given a report of what happened at Cornelius' house. Uh, if you missed any of that and you want to catch it up, you can catch those podcasts on our YouTube page or our church page. But... Now they're going to introduce the next step when it comes to the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish, um, taking and receiving the word. And Antioch is a Jewish, uh, sorry, Gentile church. So um, we're going to dig into this, kind of go through and see what a good church looks like. Because if you've not experienced in the past, I think there's some things to get excited about here. Um, finding a bad church is, is easy. 
I think most of us can say somewhere in our past we've had a bad church or a bad pastor. Um, the, the, this is not something that should be overly surprising because whenever there is a community, whether it be a motorcycle club or a sports team or school or work or whatever it is, whenever there's people, it's messy. Uh, but it seems that it hurts more when it comes to church because we are taught that church is supposed to be a loving community and a hospital and you've got people that are loving on you and that type of stuff. Um, the Bible does tell us that the church is also a messy place. It's how we handle it. It's how we handle it makes the difference. And that's usually what leads to a lot of church hurt. Um, if you look in the scripture, if you look at the, like the church in uh, Corinth, uh, if you look at the letters in, um, to the Corinthians, uh, they were really jacked up. They had all kinds of issues. Um, it took two lengthy letters from Paul to address the, the concerns he had. Um, they had a member having a relationship with his stepmom. They had worship services that were a mess. They were fractioned and following different leaders within the, the, the church community. Uh, they had Christians suing one another within the church. Uh, they were confused on relationships, and they were having financial faith issues left and right. So it's not that a messed up church is something new. Uh, the church in Rome, they had sin struggles. They had profound doctrinal issues. In other words, they were really jacked up on how they were trying to teach the scripture. They were teaching incorrect things. They had church and state issues. They also had church fellowship uh, functionality issues. There's a lot of charges. So it's not surprising that church can get messy too. The church in Galatia battled over the nature of the gospel, the role of the law, and freedom of conscience. And so they had to write the letter of the Galatians to correct them as well. Ephesus struggled with the nature of the church, the function of the leaders, and the application of the gospels and relationship. This is a church that Paul left, loved and Paul was with for years and years and years. You have the Philippians that had challenges, Thessalonians had challenges, the Colossians had challenges. You have Jesus in the, the Revelation 2 and 3 writing the seven letters to the seven churches that were there at the time. And that five out of seven, he was basically kind of spanking their hand and saying, look, if you pull it together, we can really jam here. But I'm going to, going to let it continue like this. Uh, you might consider uh, like a year ago, we had a, uh, a study on bad churches and looking at those and the, the co-functions of those churches that were struggling compared to the church today, at least in the United States, also includes the state of Ohio, also includes the city of Marion, that there's a lot of challenges with the church. It's really not that hard to find some jacked up issues. But the thing is, it's not about finding some place that's not messy at times. It's about those who hold on to the scripture during those times to find correction, to find direction to find things to bring, bring unity back into place. So that's what we see within Antioch, where they have these different out, uh, challenges and issues. So like I said, we'll read a little, talk a little. I mostly just want to get the story on your table, and then we'll pick it apart for the uh, points that apply to our life today. So starting out, verse 19 in chapter 11. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, that's probably wrong, Cyprus, and Antioch speaking the word to no one except for the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and of Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Whenever, uh, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and the faith. And a great number of people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were called Christians. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And this they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So this is the beginning of the story. Chris, if we put up the, the li next list there. This is the, the beginning. Acts 11, 19, 34, note takers. So we get introduced to... Uh, Antioch. Antioch is a seaport city. It is the third largest city in the known world at the time. Uh, it is very multicultural. So while Jews are in the area, most of it is Gentile based from all different areas because of the trade that came through, through the seaport and the tourism that came because it was such a beautiful city 
that people would go the, go there as I, I did to go to Florida to see my son or whatever the case would be. That, that it was a tourist destination as well. Uh, they had about 500,000 to 800,000 people in the community on a constant basis, which is about 10 to what, 16 times larger than Marion. If that kind of gives you a little bit of a feel. Uh, when it comes to religion, it's pluralistic. They have multiple gods, uh, Zeus, Poseidon, Adonis are some of the ones, and it's now in Turkey for those who would like, like to have those kind of details in place. But what we find is as because of the persecution, and this really, uh, one of the things I love about this little section is everything we studied just comes right back to the table. Because of the persecution, which we've read about with Stephen and Stephen being killed because of his testimony, that Saul, <coughs> over Saul, gave authority over, uh, they have been scattered out. That's how we're now moving into the world, out, outside of the three areas we've already discussed. Um, and so they, they come to this place, and most of the Jewish minist- missionaries want nothing to do with anybody that's Gentile. There's still this funk that we're going to see play out about Gentiles being able to be Christians, that they have been raised that it is a Jewish religion, that God is, people is the Jews, and that they, they, they're not circumcised, they don't follow the law, they're not as good as we are, still come to play, and so most of the Jews are going out, even for, that are Christians, that are post, been persecuted and scattered out, will not go to Gentiles still. This is still an issue on the table. However, some did, and we see a great revival coming into play as they come into this particular city in Antioch. So when all this starts jamming, and keep in mind how the apostles are feeling at this point, they just heard from Peter about what happened at Cornelius' house, which again, that was our last study in this series, or two studies ago. Um, and they're still like, okay, so God obviously has opened up the Gentiles, and we're hearing this is going on here, but I don't know, it just makes me nervous. We need to get check us out. We need to somehow, I mean, just whenever your structure is kind of pushed a little bit, it can, it can bring some anxiety. So they send Barnabas, which we've studied before. And Barnabas is a great Jewish man. He is so um, sacrificial in his giving to help people in need that he has been called Barnabas, which means encourager. That's not his normal name. That's what the disciples decided to call him. And they said, Barnabas, we trust you. We love you. Can you go down and visit and check this out and come back and tell us what you see? And so Barnabas goes back and he checks it out and he says, I like this. You see that? I like this. This This is home. And so he basically sends word back saying, I'm not coming home. This is really too good. This is true. It's like when, when I went to Africa a couple months ago for the mission trip, and I'm like, okay, when I come back, I'm going to report to you everything that happened. And then you get a letter from me saying, guys, I love you. I ain't coming home. This is this, what's happening here. That I got to be part of this. And so, so the Jewish church was probably pretty shocked by that. And so Barnabas was there, and he's doing the work, and he's kind of an unlikely leader in this situation with the church of Antioch, and he needs help. And so what we see that's crazy within the story still is instead of additional Jewish men coming from the apostles to come help him. He goes and finds Saul, the one guy that nobody wants to work with because he's a murderer or had been a murderer of Christians and no one really trusted him, but now he's come to the Lord and he's turned his ways and he's been sharing the testament. He's like, that's the perfect misfit for this misfit church, right? And so he goes and gets Saul and he comes back and says he spends a whole year teaching them and leading them. <clears throat> and the Jewish community, and they continue to send people, and in those days, as you say, in 27, um, it was 27 through 30 there, some prophets come down, they, they, they prophesize about a famine that's going to hit everywhere, everywhere, and the Antioch believers said that we must give sacrificially, uh, uh, as each one had, the, had ability, and send money to our brothers in Jerusalem to help them during this famine, and that, that's what they did. So, from, from that time, Paul and Barnabas take that offering uh, to the church of Jerusalem, and they're there for a time, and then they come back after that gift, and they resume the leadership. So let's j- jump up to the next section, uh, that they were seeking, and they were set apart. And that's Acts 13, uh, and I'll just read these. If you're in the U version, I gave you that main chunk, but I'm just reading these, so you might want to open them up and read them, or trust me, and then check later to see if I made stuff up. Uh, verse 1, now... There were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. That's a lot of names. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me 
Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. So, of course, we'll leave that list up the whole time, or for a while, if you don't mind. Uh, we're just going to kind of be walking through it. Thank you. Um, so so they've, they've come back home. Everybody's happy that they're home. Everybody's great. Everything's good. Uh, you guys are really gracious. Uh, not when I'm here. Uh, I mean, no, not, not, yeah, not, not when I'm not here, because I watch the videos, and so when you guys say, Pastor Tom's finally gone, and you're like, ah, I see that, it hurts. And then, but I come home, and you guys are pretty gracious to me, right? You guys, you guys are very lo- lovely to us. They're happy to be able to have that back. And so they start praying, and they're seeking the Holy Spirit, and says, Holy Spirit says, I want them to leave again. And they go on what is officially the first mission trip ever, ever, as we define missions today. It, it, it was never thought of before. There was no pastor conferences that they talked about missions. There was no church leadership books that said, oh, you've got to be able to do mission trips and all that kind of stuff. This is the first mission trip that the Holy Spirit designed, invented, and sent them on. And for the next several um, paragraphs after paragraphs through a couple of chapters, it defines the first mission trip uh, and what they went through. And they went through a lot. Uh, there's a lot of good things and a lot of bad things, too. I'll tell you, one of the things that, that you see by stats, uh, and this is true, and as a former bookstore, Christian bookstore owner, I can, I can attest to this, that this, the stereotype is women lean into faith more than men do, uh, which is true, and um, I see too many, way too many spiritual single parents, and mom and grandma usually seem to be the ones that are making up the gap, um, and men, we, we need to step up. That's a, just as simple as that. But like from a Christian bookstore standpoint, I remember, it's been a while now, but uh, we had a woman section, and the resources for women, I mean, it covered like two shelving units. Not like shelves like this, but like units of shelves. And the men's department was like one. And really it wasn't it was like, well, they don't really buy it, so we don't want to get I mean, I had to search hard to fill that one because the resources weren't there because men didn't lean into it. And one of the things that they say that it might be for men from stereotypes of how we look at men and women and those type of things um, is because people, like if you look at the, the women resources, it was love and it was peace and it was hope and it's the gifts of the spirit and it was pink and it was light blue cover, you know, that, that type of thing. And that men don't lean into that as much, uh, which actually all that stuff is awesome and men should. But that's kind of the stereotype aspect and they would want to see something more manly. Uh, I don't know if you can read the story of Jesus and what he went through and not realize just how tough that guy was and what he went through. Just even his death and his torture, what he went through for us is insane and how manly his love was as well as the truth. But here, um, just this is a side note, but in chapter 14, uh, verse 19 through 20, if you want to write down, I don't think I put it in the, the notes, um, but at the time, it says, but when Jews came from Antioch and they anchored him. So again, you have Antioch, bless you. But uh, it's not the Gentiles, it's the Jews. It's the people that are mad at him for what he's been doing in their city when it comes to their faith. And they've been persuaded the crowds, and the, pro- the crowd stoned Paul or Saul, dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. They had beat him down to the point that they, they were certain he was dead and just dragged him out. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and he entered back into the city. On the next day, he went on with Barnabas and Doby. That's kick butt. I'm sorry. That's good. If you saw the movie like that, never really happened. That never really happened. This is a guy that had stood at the authority of stoning Stephen to death, and they know he's dead. And he's, he gets back up, brushes it off, limps back into the town they just kicked him out of, and said, I think I'll take a nap before I move on my mission trip. These guys are tough. God leads us through a lot of stuff. So anyway, so we had the, 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 the first mission trip, and then we come up to, uh, let's see, the return. Let's go to chapter 14. This is when they report, and they focus on to discipleship, which I think is missing an E, maybe? I don't know. Uh, but 14, verse 26, from there, after the mission trips, they saw back to Antioch, where they had been com- uh, commended to the grace of God for the work that had been fulfilled. And when they arrived, they gathered the church, they declared all that God had done and how they had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with disciples. In other words, for a long time they stayed there and they continued as a church and discipling one another. So far, things are sounding good. There's a couple of points here that I'll tell you, for most churches, would have led to a split that did not even get touched by Antioch because of the way they dealt with things. We'll talk about that deeper when we get into 
uh, have the supplies. However, now we come up against the first challenge when there is a conflict, when they are trying to figure out how to handle it. Um, and it's over circumcision. As again, the Jews are saying, you guys I, I are just really uncomfortable with you. And so they step into this, and this is what happens in chapter 15. So men came down from Judea, again, the country of the faith, and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dis dissension and debate with them, in other words, after they went head to head to head to head with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed by the church to go to Jerusalem, to where their leadership was, to the apostles and to the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phasonia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversions of the Gentiles, or even on their trip, they're, they're sharing the gospel, and brought great joy to all the brothers. So Jews come in and says, yes, it's great that Jesus has opened the door for you guys, but you really still need to be like us. You ever hear that in a, a church like, hey, I'm glad you moved from tier one to tier two. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask me later. Uh, it's a big study we went through not too long ago. And tier one, tier two, and you accepted Jesus. But before you go out and start doing ministry stuff, you need to really look more like us. You need to be like us. And the, the thing that they, they took and determined was circumcision, which is, if you don't know, a very painful thing for a man to do if he's not a baby and doesn't you know, scream and get over it then. And so this really made a lot of Gentile believers kind of nervous. That's not something everybody was really on board with. And so since there was a fight over this, they leaned into their leadership. They went to their leaders, sent their leaders to the leadership over their church, to deal with the situation. <clears throat> so they went, and as you go through chapter 15, it describes how that worked. They go to the church of Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem, they split over it. Half of them are saying, yes, they need to be circumcised, half are saying, no, they don't, and they almost had a complete meltdown. So then the apostles <clears throat> and James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't believe in Jesus all through his life until after his resurrection, according to the, the scripture, he's now the great bishop of Jerusalem, and they say, time out, time for an elder meeting. And <clears throat> so they all get together and they start praying about it and they seek it. And they say, you know what? Jesus fulfilled the law. And what he was really talking about was being cut to the heart for Jesus. And if you haven't noticed by now, somebody should be giving me a bottle of water somewhere. Ginger, I love you. I love you, Ginger. She was on it. Everybody else is like, let's see how this works out. No, Ginger. You're awesome. <clears throat> if you're a visitor. They really don't like me. <laughs> and so they decide that we're not putting this burden on them, and they send a letter back, and it brings them back into unity by what the, the leaders have for them. And so <clears throat> now here's the thing. I'm guaranteeing you some people left the church over this. Some people didn't like what the leaders had to say about it. Some people got mad. Some people left. But it provided for the unity of the church. I don't think it's going to help. <clears throat> I've been bragging that my legendary sinus attack coming back from the south was not happening this time. It started yesterday. So just enjoy the sexy DJ voice. Okay. So continuing through, I promise you we're almost there. There's so much information. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> when we're going to pick it back up into 36, chapter 15, where the letter comes back, there's great celebration. But after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we reclaim the word of the Lord during our first mission trip and see how they are. And Barnabas wanted to take with him John, who's called Mark. This is the same Mark that wrote the gospel, Mark. But Paul thought best not to take Mark with them because he belled on them when they were in the pamphlet city and had not gone with them to work, to do the work, rest of the work. And there was a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and he sailed away to Cyprus on a second mission trip. And Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went throughout Syria and Cilia. Uh, that's not right. Strengthening the churches. So now we have two different mission trips going out. So they're continuing to, the focus on taking the word out like they're supposed to. Uh, I cannot tell you whether or not Paul and Silas' fight was holy or not. Uh, uh, they, they had a disagreement how it was handled to be whether or not it was holy. Mark was uh, Barnabas' cousin, if I remember correctly. Like I said, he belled on him, and Paul said, I, I just, this is too important. I, I don't think we should be, be going for this. And Bob was like, this is my brother. This is my daughter. Oh, my gosh. 
If there's a nurse in the house, that might help in a couple more minutes. We have nurses in the house, don't we? If not, I've got school teachers galore. I don't know what you guys are going to do, but probably tell me to get over it and send me out. You were the one trashing me at the very beginning. Yeah, I can tell. And, uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless, whether they leveraged it for the kingdom, and they, they moved out and they did these two mission trips. And then we hear a lot about Paul's mission trip. We don't hear so much about Barnabas's. And then Acts 18, verse 22, we come back to the short stop. When he landed at Syria, he went up and greeted the church and then went back down to Antioch. After spending some time with them, he departed and went from one place to the next to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. That's, that's the story of Antioch. There's more, but that's how the Acts lays it out for us as we go into it. And one of the reasons why I think it's so great, one, we get so much that we can mine out of it. But secondly, just because we have so much. Uh, I think there's a quote in there, Chris, the next one. Um, by an author, a book I studied a while back called The Case for Antioch. It says, what a remarkable story. We have detailed account of this amazing congregation, the first predominantly Gentile church, from its birth through its role in launching the gospel towards Rome, then the most important city in the Mediterranean world. We have a lot to work with. And I would suggest to you, and the presentation I'm going to make, is if we continue to grow more and more to act like the Acts Church, we, or, or the, the Antioch Church, it will still be messy at times, like the Antioch Church. But we will be the Church of Jesus if we follow their lead on how they dealt with things. And in this testimony that we have, we pull several things when it comes to what we ask for people to commit to if they want to be a member at the fellowship. There's people here that are fellowship was that are not members. There are those that uh, our fellowship was that our members, it's just I want to commit that this is my church home whenever that happens. Um, and there's things that we ask because having a heart for people who have been hurt by church before and myself going through some experiences, uh, we want to deaden that chance of that happening here. You know, people always get hurt, always be messy, as long as it's done with 100% love and 100% truth. But when people start dealing with the struggle and they start going with their ways and they start trying to control it, especially a pastor or an elder, or even just the, the, the people in the church themselves, it just hurts, and it's wrong. And so if you look out there, there's, there's a brochure for those who've been considering membership or have gone through membership. And there's certain statements that we ask for to you to commit to, as well as commitments that we commit to in your life from a biblical standpoint. And I want to go through those, and I want to show you how the Church of Antioch really exhibits as well. So, Chris, we'll go to the next one. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is unity. Unity is something that is unbelievably imperative. If you look back at church hurt in your past, um, you can usually see a lack of unity somehow, whether it be in the leadership or within the church or people stabbing each other in the back or gossip or whatever hurtful thing comes into play. Um, and here's the things that we see within the Church of Antioch that's really important that we do as well. First off, they follow the Spirit. And, and Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, pointed that out in several ways. First off, Barnabas, when he's introduced in this section, they sent him, why? Because he's full of the Holy Spirit. That was chapter 11, verse 24. Agabus, the, the prophet who came and predicted the famine, uh, did so by the Spirit. That's verse 28 in chapter 11. Uh, when they were coming together and worshiping and see, seeking the Holy Spirit about what was next for their church and the mission that he's called them to, the Spirit intervened and said, I'm going to take your leaders away again. Uh, and they, they found that by seeking the Holy Spirit, which we need to do more of, instead of just coming up with our own plans. And secondly, when they heard the news and they're like, ugh, they prayed, they fasted, they laid hands on him, and they said, okay, Lord. There was a unity by following the Spirit. They also had uh, unity by following the Spirit-led leaders. By the Spirit led leaders. Again, Barnabas, son of encouragement, sent by Jerusalem, check out the Antioch happenings. They ended up staying and leading, teaching, bringing in Paul, took a risk with Paul to bring him in. Stood side by side with Paul when he went against the Judaizers when they were teaching something that was not biblical. Uh, lived it in his missions uh, all the way to his death that we know from, uh, from our church history. Paul, one of the most di uh, dynamic and colorful testimonies that you're ever going to find. 
who was very passionate about teaching and following the Spirit and um, taking and confronting others, whether it be with Barnabas and Mark or the Judaizers themselves. We also see Simeon as a leader there, Lucius, Manon uh, as a leader there. The Church of Jerusalem was leaders over their individual church. Um, these are things that were very, very important that if we want unity, there has to be leadership, and God puts that into place. The problem is, is when the leaders become idiots and when the leaders don't follow the Spirit anymore or they have their own way or they have their own um, methods or whatever the case may be and they're not being godly, um, then that's a problem. When we were studying James uh, 1 and 2 uh, this past Wednesday, we were talking about judging uh, leaders and how he was telling us that if these things are in place, that leader is not a Christian leader, that's a liar, and you shouldn't be following them. And we talked about our general uncomfortability with judging pe people. Again, there's judging the way that's bad, but biblical judging still is uncomfortable because we've seen judging so bad that's bad. And the example I threw out was the good judging is if I'm the pastor of this church, and I've been here now almost 21 years since we started the church, and everybody knew the well-known secret that I was sleeping around with the woman around the community behind my wife's back. It might be time to make a judgment call. Right? You, you, that's not biblical. That's not okay. A pastor shouldn't be doing that. All pastors shouldn't be doing that. It needs addressed. And when pe people go off track, that it needs addressed. But if they're following Christ, then we follow our leaders. And that's why we also have multiple leaders within the church instead of me just being in control of everything. Um, and then that's, that's where it comes back to some of these other challenges. If, if, you, if something happened that I was really off base and you felt I was a base, um, here, here's what I, I ask you to do. It's the Matthew 18 model. It's not commanded this way, but it's a good model to use. And we just talked about this the other night as well. Dan brought it up. Um, if I'm doing something idiotic, come and talk to me about it and call me out. The goal is... One, we don't need gossip. We don't need a bunch of stuff behind the scenes. But the goal is either you'll, you'll get my attention and I'll be like, oh my gosh, and I'll open my eyes like David did with Nathaniel. Or I might tell you something that you didn't know because we're just in different positions of the, the different things you're doing. And it might, you might go, oh, okay, I didn't get that. I didn't understand that. That's hard to see from outside looking in. Or I might say, I just disagree with you. And if it still bothers you, then I ask you to go and find one friend, two friends that are with you that are mature Christians, not the people that you packed up because they agree with you, but mature Christians, and come hit me again. And either one or two or three is going to happen. And if three happens, take it to the elders. Take it to the church. That's why we, that's why we put to out, you know, I mean, there's God Almighty. That's who, who's my, my balance of the elders within the church. And talk to them. Let them facilitate without the emotions that maybe you have or I have. And either one's going to happen or two's going to happen, and we have great celebration. Or I find out the elders disagree with me, and I have to determine, okay, I'm under the leadership, so I need to submit to that, or I, don't, I shouldn't be here anymore. That, that's really the two options. Or they don't agree with you, and I either need to submit to that, or this church is jacked up and I need to leave. If we follow that model, one, we're going to have a lot more better conversations and we're all going to be a lot more mature than churches that struggle with gossip and backstabbing. That's, that's one. Secondly, it protects the unity of the church. Does that make sense? And I, I highly invite it, highly invite it. Uh, next one is, that we'll go to, oh, wait, but this is the statement that's in the, the bulletin. I will protect the unity of my church by acting in love towards one another, by refusing to gossip, and by following the church leadership. That, that's, that's the unity aspect that we're talking about. doesn't mean that the church leaders are always right, but that we're, also, we're always striving towards the Lord. Next one that <clears throat> we see within this is responsibility. Responsibility. And if you have space between those two, can I add the one that I, was com I completely skipped? <laughs> There's no one. I'm going to come back to responsibility, but also here they're submitting to one another. Put that on there. Put that on there. Submitting to one another is one of the ones that drives on this. Um, they submitted to the Church of Jerusalem. They got past the me mindset. Uh, they, they didn't let the, the fighting become the, the issue. And when the letter was there, they were glad. They rejoiced. They were strengthened. They were unified. And the statement that's within our bolt, uh, statement out there is, I'll protect the unity of my church. Uh, oh, that's where that comes into. 
Okay, as part of that unity. I'll protect the unity of my church. Okay, responsibility evangelism. Just want to get that in there. They were led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit on how they established establish the church. Um, again, so the men came, came to the Gentiles. Um, there was a, they were innovative with the, with the Gentiles. They established a teaching ministry. They progressed their gospel. Barnabas needed help, help, and he went and got Paul, and they lived it. They were the first ones to call, be called Christians. Did you see that? Here's the thing about that. Um, when we were first called Christians, it was not a compliment. There, there was never a time in Christian history where we said, we need a cool thing to call ourselves to be able to put on T-shirts and necklaces and bumper stickers. So let's call ourselves Christians, which means Christ talkers or Christ-like. The reason we're called Christians is because the people outside the church were making fun of us because we were so Christ-like. That's how they were living it. That's how they were going out and doing their, uh, their ministry of the Great Commission. And they were saying, like, see, there's Lisa. She talks, sounds like Jesus, talks like Jesus, acts like Jesus. She's a Jesus Christian. That, that, that's where it comes from. And isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? And wouldn't that be cool if that happened uh, in our lives today? Um, so they lived it. It was a slam title. Men and women shared the faith, and Christ uh, became the, the, the center, and it made a big difference. And then, of course, also the first intentional mission uh, movement outside of what they might want personally. And the statement that we have there is, I will share the responsibility of my church by praying for its growth. Have you done that lately? And I'm not just talking about how many people show up. I'm talking about our discipleship. I'm talking about what he calls us to do, the impact that we have, uh, by inviting their church to attend and by warmly welcoming those who visit, which we can't do if we're not here. Participate. Next one. Participate or serve. I'm telling you, I told you I was going to take some extra time this week. Not that I care about that. But I will get you to lunch eventually. Participate. So if Antioch gave away its money, uh, this one I think is really, really cool. Okay, you could say, they, sure, they gave away the money as they could because they were affluent and they had trade and they had lots of money and it didn't really matter. Um, and I don't have any money. So you could take that position. And that is one of the two big struggles. But that's not why it's so amazing about what they did. What they did when they heard about the famine that was coming, which would impact them, they said, we need to take a collection to bless the Church of Jerusalem. The Church of Jerusalem has said, but your Gentiles were suspect. We're sending people to investigate you. Um, we, we're glad things are going. That's going well. But we, and that's all that's happened up to this point. Now, we see them get more and more partnership as time goes on. Amen, right? But at this point, when they did the collection, none of that was there. And you would almost think from a worldly standpoint, they'd be like, good luck, jokes. You know, there's almost be this, uh, some of us look at giving to a charity or to church or whatever the case may be, or helping somebody in need, and say, but are they really going to use it well? Or have they, have, have they, are they in that place because they made bad decisions before? We come up with all kinds of reasons, right? They just said, it doesn't matter, we're going to take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ. They participated by give, giving away of, of their finances. They participated by giving away of their leaders. The leaders. I remember there was a time with church in Smokies that we had relationships with that was going through a horrible time. Uh, and they asked for me to come down to do consulting and, and spend time with them and, just, and to, to preach for a couple weeks here, a couple weeks there, like over several months. It kept traveling back and forth. And one of the things I loved about that, that current group of elders is I brought that to them. And we were young. We didn't have, much, you know, we didn't have money. We still have, you know, but, but we have a lot less then. And we had a lot of our own struggles. And the elders said, if God's calling you to go there, you got to go. We'll take care of things here. And that, that, that's part of serving that responsibility of, of, of living with it and being able to serve within the body of Christ. I'll tell you one of the things. I'm going to brag on somebody, um, and I think they're okay with it, but I don't like to brag about people and tell them beforehand because that's usually when they fight me. So, Neil, I'm going to talk about you for a second. Is that okay? <laughs> for those who didn't see, he threatened me. Um, <laughs> Neil was showing yesterday in the men's group, the awesome group, by the way, and um, he, he kind of falls into, and I, I might take a little liberty with this, but he falls into a very common boat that when he first came to fellowship or when other people first come to fellowship, they usually come and say, not usually, but a lot of times, 
Um, the last church I was at, I volunteered all the time. I was serving all the time. Um, they used me as a resource. They burnt me out. I just need some time to heal. I don't remember Neil saying that story, but I hear that a lot from people. And I do know that you know, I was some, somewhat in that ballpark. And we fully get that. And we meet people there and say, yeah, heal. Let's love on you for a little while and whatnot. Uh, unfortunately, oftentimes, they never plug back in. Um, and so that healing period ends up lasting three, five, seven, ten years, whatever the case may be, because we get used to not serving within the church. Um, and so Neil was sharing about the t- when I came and asked him about doing the men's group. Um, was, I think you said a year and a half ago, and started the group about half a year ago. So there was a year time of processing. And he showed kindly, and that is some of this I, I yeah, was between just him and the guys, but uh, you know, just the anxiety that came with it, and the, 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 fear, and, you know, the work that would come with it, and the commitment would come with it. And then one day just going, but God's given me this gift, and I'm not using it. I'm not using it in the church. And he shared things that God has done through it with him. Uh, uh, the, the guys that participated in that, um, I've been truly blessed, truly blessed by Neil and his service and what the Holy Spirit does with him. I'm not down in the women's group. You guys are doing great stuff, and I can do a very similar story, at least with one, if not both, of the leaders of that group as well. But um, we, need, we need to be able to use our gifts not just in our own life or to make money, but also within the church. And that's when the church goes from um, having too many empty spots to having too many volunteers. So if you're waiting for someone to ask you to jump in, uh, that's not the way to go. That's not the way to go. What does God gift you to do? Plug in. Let me know. We'll find a way to plug in. That's not a problem. We should move from three months of saying, guys, we really need three nursery workers. We had three people that step out for various reasons, and we badly need it. People are doing triple duty over there because we love our babies, and no one step up. We, we um, should not be going three months with, hey, Miss Sandy needs an assistant on Wednesday nights with the kids' ministry and hear crickets. What we should, should be doing is, and I'll celebrate the good things too, uh, Miss Audrey putting out that she would like some backup help on the bulletins and two people step up instead of one. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Had a brother st- uh, step up, well, man, I'll just call you out. Brent talked to me yesterday, like, hey, look, I do finances. This is what I do for a living. This is what my experience is. Where can I plug in? And we'll meet next week because there is a need. So I, it, it, participating in serving is a big part of it. So that's why we have that commitment in there for members, is I will support the ministry of my, uh, of my church by developing a servant's heart, by discovering my gifts and talents, and better equip myself for Christian service. Uh, and then the next one, thank you, Noah. Giving, living up. So we study these testimonies, again, people who are purposeful, they were very purposeful at a very short period of time. The new converts, automatically sacrificial uh, givers. Uh, the hint of the change that we see is Acts 11, 26, where Barnabas and Paul taught the church, I love how Luke phrases it, a whole year. A year in the scheme of things doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but they really leaned into the teaching and they followed it. Uh, they were following the spirit aspects of things. Uh, the conversion brought an actual change in their lives instead of people who say a little prayer just to get out of hell free. They surrendered control of their life to God. They stopped the sinful behavior, and they accepted uh, feeling and, and, uh, and live by faithfulness. That's why you see the, the phrase there. I was put the testimony of my church by attending faithfully, by living a godly life at home and at work. So our witness is not that we are not really listening to what the Word calls us to, and by giving regularly of my work resources and financial support. Here's the thing, when we're talking about member, membership, which I know is kind of a big thing to talk about when you're welcoming people who have been hoped by church before and they're like, he already wants money. Um, that's not what we're doing. What we're saying is there's a better way than what you've experienced so far. It's messy, but it's good when we lean into the spirit instead of our own wants and desires. And it's beautiful. Because we're not made to go through this crap that we go through alone. We're just not. I had a friend going through a whole bunch of time. Just said that to us last week. Whatever we can do because you're not, we're, we, we're, just, we're not equipped for this stuff. We need the Lord. We need each other. And we need that Christian community. And so when I talk about membership, I'll be honest, because of my pastor church, I hate the word membership because it was always a country club membership. You become a member, you get a key to the church, you get a vote, that kind of crap. 
But when I see it as a member of the body of Christ, then something comes alive. Then something comes alive. And it's my hope that for all of us who are here at our fellowship is that we continue to lean into, especially if you remember, you're leaning into your commitment here, but not because you're committed here, but because the Bible calls us to it. And then secondly, if you've been hurt by church before, I hope that you can see a little bit of a glimpse that there's something better than maybe what people have given you in the past. And it's what the Holy Spirit wants for us.